welcome to the jm power session and uh, as you can see judges are established respected people with years of experience behind them so despite we have, we have drawn the judges from many institutions and like known for their integrity as well so despite being however careful like there can be instances of uh, conflict of interest so the judges are aware of that and whenever there's a conflict of interest for instance somebody is presenting from their own institution that particular judge will not act for them. So this is to make sure that there is no bias. That's all I wanted to say, and I hand it over to back to the moderator for the beginning of the session. So all of you are aware of the rules. Just to remind about the timing, presenter will be given eight minutes time to present. And after that, which will be followed by the four minute discussion. You will be given a reminder at six minutes and after eight minutes, automatically the PowerPoint will stop. Okay, so now I invite the first presenter, Dr. Siddharth. He's presenting on development of a novel CRISPR based diagnostic platform for rapid diagnosis of fungal endophthalmitis. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be presenting my work on the development of a novel CRISPR-based diagnostic platform for the rapid diagnosis of fungal endophthalmitis. So before I begin, a little background on CRISPR. In one line, they are the antibody equivalents in prokaryotes. So when we eukaryotes come in contact with a virus, we recognize their proteins and produce specific antibodies against them proteins, which we have leveraged in creating vaccines. In the primitive state of the prokaryote immune system, they rather recognize foreign nucleotide sequences, engineer CAS enzymes to recognize these sequences and cleave them. We have very recently started leveraging this ultra specificity of bacterial CAS for genome editing and diagnosis. In India, 11 to 22 percent of culture prone endophthalmitis is due to fungus. Given the extensive variation reported in culture positivity in endophthalmitis, we may only be seeing the tip of the iceberg as far as the instance is concerned. Not unlike other invasive fungal infections, rapid diagnosis remains a bottleneck. So we need a test that is rapid, accurate, accessible, and affordable. See, what is the current diagnostic armamentarium? So direct microscopy, though fast and cost effective, it still needs significant expertise, and its clinical utility is limited in endophthalmitis, unlike keratitis. Culture is very specific, but lacks the sensitivity, is time consuming, and again requires dedicated equipment and personnel. So the advent of PCR revolutionized fungal diagnostic to an extent, but even it requires expensive equipment and personnel. So the identification of a rapid, sensitive, and easy to implement diagnostic modality remains the pivotal desideratum of fungal endophthalmitis management. So we set out to precisely do the same using CRISPR. So we have termed this as a RIDMIC, which stands for rapid identification of mycosis using CRISPR. So we had two main objectives. The first was to develop the assay and then to compare it with existing diagnostic modalities. The assay primarily has two components, an isothermal amplification step, which amplifies the target fungal DNA if present, and the CRISPR reaction itself, which gets activated in the presence of the target, amplified target DNA and cleaves the fluorescent reporter. So in the presence of the target nucleotide sequence, CRISPR is activated and cleaves the fluorescent reporter. Because our aim was to develop this assay, both as a potential point of care test and as an alternative to PCR, we included both the quantitative and the qualitative readout. Qualitative readout gives us an easy binary readout as seen here, which makes it ideal for point of care testing while quantitative results can help predict fungal load in tertiary facility. The next step was to test the specificity of the assay. We used known isolates. As seen here, a positive test was seen with all tested fungal DNA, but not with bacterial or human DNA. Both the readouts are depicted here. All tested fungal DNA fluoresce, and the corresponding spike is seen in the spectrophotometer readings. The next step was to compute the limit of detection. So the limit of detection of RIDMIC was 13 to 16 genome copies, which was similar to the LOD of panfungal PCR as reported by Gaudio et al. So this video shows the workflow of the RIDMIC assay. The whole process takes less than 60 minutes and only requires a heat block, which costs around 35,000 rupees, and a pipe at around 2,000 rupees. As you can see here, pipetting is the only technique which is required here, and the learning curve is extremely quick. First, the RPA mixture is added to the extracted DNA from the intraocular fluids, which is placed in the heat block for 30 minutes, followed by the CRISPR reaction, which again happens at 37 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes, followed by the visual readout. 
So the next step after development was to clinically validate this assay, 86 intraocular samples including 62 vitreous and 24 aqueous humor samples of 75 patients with suspected infective endophthalmitis were included. Conventional institutional practice was that the uh, specimens were subjected to direct microscopy and culture. So in addition, panfungal PCR and rhythmic assay was performed for this study. Of the 86 specimens, 18 were positive for bacteria and culture while none were positive for fungus. 18 were positive for fungus by the rhythmic and 14 for fungus by the panfungal PCR. So 80 specimens were concordant between rhythmic and PCR, 6 were showed discordant results. So the concordance rate was 93%. The sensitivity and specificity in comparison to PCR was 92.86 and 93.06% respectively. The concordance rate however between clinical suspicion of fungal endophthalmitis and PCR and rhythmic was only 63%. Another interesting observation was among the patients who were positive for fungus by rhythmic and PCR, five received antifungal therapy and all five showed improvement in their clinical status. This I believe is the, clinic, the clinching evidence to establish the validity of this assay. So a small subset of specimens, both ITS and 16S next generation sequencing was performed. So the first three samples were all negative for fungus in culture but positive by rhythmic and panfungal PCR. So all three showed predominantly aspergillus DNA by NGS. One sample was negative for fungus by culture and rhythmic but PCR was positive but NGS had established that it was indeed bacterial and not fungal. Three samples were positive by fungus by rhythmic and not PCR and three showed fungal DNA in NGS. So now I will be sharing a few interesting case scenarios which highlights the advantages of this CRISPR based assay. So the first patient was a 90 year old male diagnosed with endogenous endophthalmitis except for panfungal PCR everything pointed towards a diagnosis of bacterial endophthalmitis. So off-target amplification leading to false positives is one of the major limitations of PCR. So in PCR, specificity is driven by the specificity of the two primers to the target DNA. So essentially there's just one checkpoint. However, in rhythmic, in addition to the specificity of the primers, the CRISPR RNA also has to be specific. So there are two checkpoints. So this makes rhythmic more specific than PCR and limits off-target amplification. So case number two, a 32 year old male with history of trauma with vegetative matter and treated with topical antifungals elsewhere is referred after developing intraocular inflammation. AC tap was done, culture was negative but both rhythmic and PCR were positive for fungus. So repeated cultures from subsequent corneal scrapes eventually grew dermatitious fungi. So this case highlights another advantage of nucleic acid detection strategies like rhythmic and PCR because them unlike culture are not affected by prior antifungal or antimicrobial therapy. The third case is a very interesting case. A 50 year old male underwent PPV and silicon oil injection for pro proliferative diabetic retinopathy. One week later patient develops features of postoperative endophthalmitis being acute, clinically suspected to be bacterial, panfungal PCR and culture were negative but rhythmic was positive for fungus. This I think but four weeks later patient develops clinical features suggestive of a fungal endophthalmitis and the suspicion shifts from bacterial to fungal. This highlights very interesting scenario where silicon oil is known inhibitor for PCR and PCR is susceptible to a myriad of inhibitors which are present in abundance in both the aqueous and the vitreous fluid. Chemistry being different, rhythmic is not susceptible to these intrinsic and extrinsic PCR inhibitors. So to summarize, the concordance rate between PCR and RIDBIC was 93% which is similar to the other studies comparing these two diagnostic tests in bacterial and viral diseases, while the concordance rate with clinical suspicion was only 63%. This is similar to the accuracy of clinical diagnosis for fungal keratitis which is reported to be around 66%. All patients positive for fungus by RIDBIC showed response to antifungal therapy. In parallel, we also ran the RIDBIC assay with keratitis samples with the sensitivity of 94 and specificity of 100% which further emphasizes the validity of this assay. So where does rhythmic fit in the existing diagnostic armamentarium? The accuracy of rhythmic is comparable to PCR at one third the cost, one fourth the time and with very little equipment and expertise. To conclude, this is the first CRISPR based system reported for the diagnosis of fungal infections in any organ system, first for the diagnosis of any ophthalmic condition or disease. Sensitivity is comparable to PCR, produces a very easy to read binary readout with a very short uh, turnaround time of 60 minutes and it can be multiplexed for species differentiation also. Thank you. Nice presentation, Siddharth. Things are important in at which you that is six minutes. First, for setting up the equipment, only two equipments are needed, so it's less than fifty thousand. The cost of the reagents is 
per test will be 300 rupees. But the another difference is there's no batch effect. You run one, you run 10, it's going to cost the same. So PCR will have a batch effect. Cost is one third of uh, PCR and one fourth the time of a uh, well, Any limitation? I will get the positive side of it. Any limitations of this? The limitations are going to be as similar to the PCR. So these are these nucleic acid detection strategies. Don't know whether the fungus is viable or not. That is the big, uh, similar to the PCR. Don't know whether the fungus is really viable. Chance of getting any false negatives? Yes, sir, because this is the first time we are designing the CRISPR RNA sequences. So these are designed against 50 pathogenic fungal species. Any fungus beyond the scope of these 50, there is a chance of being a false negative. That you have done, is, is it enough for validation? At this stage, uh, for 86, for a fungal adathalamitis, for a rare disease, it is enough, sir. But the NGS is not enough. Next generation sequencing we are done only in a small subset. False positives? Put false positives? False positives, sir, again, like unlike PCR, there's only one checkpoint in PCR. We did not see any false positives till now. But PCR, we saw one case. PCR has one checkpoint, this has two checkpoints. Because other than this uh, specificity of the primers, the CRISPR RNA sequence also has to be specific. Subjective factors in the readings? No, sir. There was one visual. Uh, so, as far as the fluorescence is pretty day and night, sir. But the spectrophotometer reading can be subject to, but they are going to predict the fungal load. This is in house. How are you going to extrapolate it for the uniformity across all the centers? Like, did have those issues with PCR? Like, with the in house primers, we had difficulty in extrapolating the results. Is this a similar issue with yes, this? There are two steps, the RPA. This we have lyophilized, the stable at room temperature. Primers also are lyophilized. Only problem is going to be the they're working on. That is lyophilized. Uh, I think that should be the next logical step that to standardize it and to be able to reproduce it all across the centers. Because PCR, unfortunately, for many infective organisms, uh, we could not reproduce different centers using this technology. Great work though. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. The next presenter is Dr. Komal. Good afternoon everyone. The title of my paper is Phenotypes and Outcomes of a Novel Protocol of Early Delivery and Retinal Screening in Siblings of Familial Exudative Vitroretinopathy Probands. I have no financial disclosures. This starts with a five-month-old child who presented to us with leukocoria since birth. He was eventually diagnosed as FEVR, underwent lensectomy and vitrectomy, but we could not salvage the eyes and he was blind at five years of age. So under such a situation, there are multiple questions that the parents ask. Is it my fault? If I had consulted earlier, would it have prevented blindness in my child? More importantly, what are the chances that my next baby will have the same problem? Or can I do something to prevent it from happening to my next baby? In an attempt to answer these questions, when we went through the literature, it says that genetic testing of proband and parents along with testing of the fetus via amniocentesis for the same mutation is recommended. In a report published in 2010 by Chow et al, they described a case of NDP phenotype wherein an early delivery and screening of the second child provided a window of treatment for poorly formed retina to salvage the central vision. A similar report was published in 2014 as well. So with this background, the aim of our study was to develop a clinical protocol for such families 
which did not include fetal genetic screening and amniocentesis due to its inherent risks and poor acceptance. The study in question is a pilot retrospective study of initial experience of early delivery, retinal screening and management of neonates with the family history of FEVR spectrum. It was a retrospective analysis of patients managed on case-to-case -case basis from a prospectively collected database of FEVR. It is an interventional case series from January 2011 to December 2021 in a tertiary eye care center in South India. FEVR was diagnosed in the presence of peripheral avascular retina with or without fractional detachment or a disease tempo that was not consistent with ROP. It was staged according to the Pendergast classification. Infants presenting with bilateral total TRD with skin, teeth or hair involvement were excluded from the study in order to, over, in order to avoid overlap with the cases of incontinentia pigmenti or other syndromes. The family was explained about the risks of the next baby having FEVR. During the next pregnancy, TIFA scans were conducted for ocular development. Strict monitoring of maternal and fetal weight gain and other health factors was done. An early elective cesarean section was planned at 36 to 38 weeks, strictly in consultation with the treating obstetrician. And retinal screening was done within day 1 to day 7. The uh, groups were divided, the patients were divided into two groups. The first group where they followed full protocol and the second where they did not follow full protocol. Demography, phenotypes, treatment details, anatomical and refractive outcomes were studied. The 24 eyes of 12 patients were included in the study. Uh, when we looked at the probands, 58.3% of them had stage 5 FEVR and were blind. In the study patients, the most common, uh, the most common stage seen was uh, uh, stage 2 in group 1, whereas it was stage 5 and stage 2 in group 2. 16 patients were diagnosed as FEVR in the study group and intervention was required in all of these eyes. Uh, apart from laser photocoagulation that was required in all eyes in group 1, lens pairing vitrectomy was needed in 66 patients, 66.6% uh, 66 patients. Uh, in group 2, six, uh, 6 eyes underwent laser photocoagulation followed by a lens pairing vitrectomy and 40% of patients underwent direct lensectomy and vitrectomy because they were stage 5. The, Anatomical outcomes were much better in group 1 as compared to group 2. So 83.3% of our patients had good anatomical outcome when screened, when delivered and screened early, whereas only 40% of them had good anatomical outcome when they were delivered or screened late. So this is the sibling of the first baby that I showed in my presentation. Uh, the sibling presented to us with poorly formed macula, very hazy vitreous. Uh, he underwent sequential laser photocoagulation and still we can see the macula was very poorly formed. Uh, persistent fetal vasculature was causing foveal traction and hence the baby underwent uh, lens pairing vitrectomy. The foveal traction was relieved and we were able to save central vision. In 1995, Benson concluded that the prognosis of infants with FEVR is extremely poor. The retinal detachments in severe phenotypes of FEVR occurs at late gestation or within few days of birth. However, it is not known whether the detachment is due to primary retinal dysplasia or secondary to poor formation of retinal vasculature. Hence, the timing of delivery is extremely crucial and it needs to be balanced between the risk of developing postnatal complications due to prematurity and the risk of blindness. We believe that this protocol resulted in good and stable outcome in these eyes compared to older probands in the same family. We know that FEVR is a congenital arrest of retinal vascularization and hence the stages do not represent the course of progression of the disease. Hence, it can be argued that some of these patients in the cohort are milder phenotypes of FEVR and would have peripheral disease instead of progressing to TRD. However, it is important to note that 14 out of 16 eyes with FEVR required an additional surgical intervention, 8 of them requiring a lens sparing vitrectomy. 
none of the babies in our, uh, in our cohort at stage 1 FAVR, which could be observed. The study comes with inherent limitations. It was a pilot study managed on a case-to-case -case basis and was not randomized. There was lack of genetic evaluation. And the study is not powered to evaluate the criticality of early delivery versus early screening. Hence, to conclude, early delivery during late gestation and early screening within the first week gives us a narrow window to save these eyes from blindness. However, larger prospective studies are required to validate the protocol. Thank you. One question. In group two, you had two confounding factors. One is the normal delivery, not early delivery. Second is the late screening. Now, how do we know which of these is really making the difference between? So to my mind, late screening, probably you said 84 days versus one to seven days. So, so, the, uh, that's, so the mean uh, that's something that I'm not really sure whether the difference between the two groups is purely because of early delivery. So as I mentioned that this was a major limitation in the study because it was not powered uh, really make a difference between which of these factors uh, making a difference. We are working on that. But cases of neonatal FEVR and having a protocol like this is very difficult to actually randomize them into and to have parents actually, uh, you know, following the protocol like that. So that is why that limitation uh, there. Uh, and I do agree with you that uh, with the mean time of screening, uh, it does seem that an early screening is the major factor here than the early. But the earlier reports, as I mentioned, which are the more severe types of uh, uh, of FAVR spectrum, mostly with the end, uh, they have been reported have absolute normal uh, ocular development the TIFA scan, but they present very early with uh, tractional detachments. And the case that I actually presented uh, was uh, uh, screened on day one, and you can see the kind of macular development was there, and uh, that was de delivered in 36 weeks. So that does give a, give us an idea that these kind of things. Uh, start pretty early and uh, can lead to a detachment pretty early in life, uh, mostly between one month. So uh, to catch up that window, uh, we uh, that taking that step uh, might recommend early delivery. We really need robust data. Absolutely, early screening absolutely, absolutely no fusion there. I, early I screening is a must. I absolutely agree with that fact. Yeah, mentioned uh, sixteen eyes had. Needed surgery at the first visit itself, at the first period of examination. No, I, I mentioned that 16 eyes uh, were diagnosed with FEVR, and all of them required intervention. Form. Not just surgery. Not just only surgery. laser and all. Laser. Yeah, but out of those 16 eyes, 14 eyes required surgery eventually. There were only two eyes which were good with laser. Ultimately, there were 14 eyes which required surgery. Then early delivery did affect the normal development of any other. Yeah, the, so the systemic issues were carefully monitored, and none of them had any. None of them were premature because so of early delivery, the weight and the birth weight. Everything. Yeah, so the mean birth weight was uh, a little more than 2500 grams. And all the, I mean, from what I understood, is they're all the second siblings in the family, all the, all the cases. Yes, they are all the second two. What is the take-home message you can give? Because if EVR is a condition that we see in our clinic, from a point of view of a, in a married couple, where one person is having FEVR, what's the message that you would like to give? One of the message? most important messages uh, that I can give out of this is the screening requires to be and the treating obstetrician and the neonatologist uh, need to be very careful if there is a family, uh, probably an elective, uh, you know, cesarean, which nowadays, anyways, many are opting uh, at around 38 to 39, and be something that can be, uh, you know, opted. Komal, can I ask a question? That's a great concept, a very novel concept. Has anybody explored it before you, or you are the first one? 
So as I mentioned in my introduction, there were two reports, one in 2010, after which actually we, uh, we tried in one of, one of our cases, and the second report was in 2014. But they had done an amniocentesis, and uh, they had tested the fetus for the gene that the proband had had. So we have not done that, considering the fact that in our part of the world, that is that has a comparatively poor acceptance due to multiple issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumbal. I invite Dr. Manjula. Good afternoon. My study is about uh, persistent subretinal fluid following vitrectomy for diabetic TRD, natural course and management outcomes. The indications for vitrectomy in diabetic retinopathy, as we all know, is non-dissolving uterus hemorrhage, fractional retinal detachment involving or threatening the fovea, and combined traction regmatogenous retinal detachments. And the results of surgical management depends on the duration of macular detachment, especially in developing countries like India, timing of surgery, and the extent of macular ischemia. So why this study? Because as we know, after a successful vitrectomy for diabetic TRD, we are very happy. We have relieved all the traction inside. And when we see after one or two months or three months, see fluid under the macula. Now, people like us who are new to this field, we don't know what to do. That to go back inside something or observe, we are not very sure. The purpose of this study was to analyze the prevalence of persistent SRF after pass plena vitrectomy for diabetic TRD involving the macula study the natural course and the anatomical and functional outcomes of these patients. It was a retrospective analysis of data of 20 eyes of 20 patients with persistent SRF following vitrectomy at a single center from December 2019 to December 2020. A total of 60 eyes were operated for this involving so during that period. The macular detachment was noted on a preoperative OCT scan of the macula. The OCT was repeated at 3, 6 and 12 months postoperative. The inclusion criteria were patients 18 years or old, older more, patients with diabetic TRT involving the macula, post-operative persistent SRF at the macula documented by OCT and with one year of follow-up. Patients with no OCT records were excluded from the study. A 25 gauge microincision vitrectomy was performed in all the cases. Membranes were removed with the vitreous cutter or by using by manual technique as per the surgeon's description. ILM peeling was done using brilliant blue staining. Internal drainage of the SRF was done only in cases of breaks during the surgery. No drainage retinotomy was done. 1000 centistoke silicon oil or 10% C3 F8 gas were used as endotamponum. This is the whole cohort. Here I just want to point out that the drainage out of 60 eyes, only 4 eyes there was drainage done. And the endotamponoid was similar. ILM peeling was also done in 36 eyes and it was not done in 24. When you come to the 20 eyes, drainage was done in only one. Tamponoid was equal distribution. ILM peeling was also similar. But if you note that the duration of macular detachment was more than one month in majority of the case. For statistical analysis, with the BCVA was converted from Snell's into Logmar. The values are presented as mean plus, plus or minus standard deviation. The p values were calculated. The mean duration of decreased vision was 3 months. Persistent SRF at 3 months was seen in 20 eyes, which is 3%, but which became better at 1 year with 3 eyes having SRF at 1 year, which is 5%. And the mean time of resolution of SRF took 6 months on an average. The graph showing 33% at 3 months, which became better at 1 year. Five eyes out of the 20 during this period received additional intervention. Here also it depends on the surgeon's description. These included injection of 10% C3F8 gas or silicon oil. Here also no drainage dentotomy was done. Uh, just to quote an example, this is a 55-year-old male with left eye chronic macular detachment. OCT scan preoperatively shows the detachment. Six months post vitrectomy under oil UC RF were puzzled. But we did SOR and FAE, no drainage was done. And dramatically, at one month post SOR, you see resolution of SRF, and which, which became near normal at one year. An example with gas showing the similar results. 
when it comes to the comparison, the BCVA in Logmar at month 3 was 1.18, which improved to 0.8 at one year with a p-value which is statistically significant. The center foveal thickness also showed resolution, which was 450 microns at month 3, improved to 250 microns at one year. No statistically significant difference in final BC was noted in those eyes if there was additional intervention done. The p-value was not significant. However, the numbers are small, which could be erroneous. Pazita and Johnson described the presence of SRF in three eyes after surgery for diabetic vitrectomy. In all these three cases, they noticed the resorption of subretinal fluid, which occurred gradually with improving in vision. Meredith et al. described the technique of membrane segmentation in, patient, in patients, and they indicated that there was no need to drain the SRF since with the elimination of all the retinal traction, the retina would reattach spontaneously. Ahmed el et al. in their series of 43 patients showed that the drainage of persistent SRF may not be necessary as the SRF usually resolves over time with visual improvement also. But on the contrary, Bushfi et al. in their study reported that drainage of SRF during vitrectomy hastens the fluid absorption, hence the early visual recovery. In our study, the persistence of SRF was noted at 20 eyes at 3 months and in 3 eyes at 1 year. Patients in the observation group where there was no additional intervention was done, they showed a statistically significant improvement in vision. However, those patients who underwent additional intervention, there was no difference at all. Our study has limitations being retrospective in nature and the small sample size. So to conclude, in this retrospective study, the incidence of persistent SRF after vitrectomy was 33% at 3 months, which improved to 5% at 1 year. It was independent of the surgical technique, what you use, you feel the ILM or the tamponade, it, 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 they had no role. And here I cannot comment of the drainage because majority of the patients didn't undergo drainage. SRF resolved slowly over time with statistically significant functional as well as anatomic improvements and additional interventions for these SRF did not achieve better results and interventions may not be necessary. I, these are my references. I would like to thank VRSI for allowing me to present this paper in this paper. Thank you. To also look at other risk factors like duration and all for the uh, fluid resorption. So you looked into the duration, whether it is contributing. Yes, the duration also mattered. Majority of our patients had a macular detachment of more than months. That could be the reason because this is a retrospective study and we couldn't get the data properly. But majority of the patients had a chronic macular TRT. Any patient have a redundant macula with a fold came to resolve? They're all uh, dome they yeah, they were all dome shapes. I, I, this is you intervened, isn't it? How did you decide? Purely the surgeons, probably the vision, because in these five patients, the vision tended to be low even after this. That you could have looked at? Are so? The operative size of the TRD, you know? TRD, TRD is. is quite large. So, so we looked into that also. It was purely tractional. There was no rig component involved in this. Slightly larger area of involvement and operatively you are in a confusion whether to drain or whether to just sleep. Many of us, this is a very big debate whether you should create a retinotomy and drain a TRD or just you know, leave it like that. In fact, I think in the retinet meeting when I went once, this was a big debate where Yes, and others, some of them, oh, we will make a retinol. Size sometimes may be a reason also for persistent retinal fluid. Yard is most of the not use an anti yeah. They were all uh, chronic and more were gliotic. Vascular comp you know, I have eliminated thus that factor really.
surgery I was born. Just only. Only on the presence of SRF and additional intervention, it was not exactly a resurgery, sir. If it is a top up gap, gas, or in some cases, oil was injected. Uh, I would be interested was there a difference between gas and oil? Yeah, was, you showed that. Yes, sure. okay. It was the second thing would be the resorption would depend on the health of the RPE, which could be influenced by the previous laser or even by the systemic control that patient has. These may be the confounding factors, so when you are trying further, good idea to do autofluorescence. See how healthy is your RPE and how good is the control so that you know, because the hemodynamic alterations due to anemia, uh, other uh, globulins being low in these patients could influence uh, oh, absorption, sense. yes. So Maybe. I would... I would look into that if you wish to publish. Look into that. I understand. Madam. That's okay. Because, uh, because all these were with, uh, underwent surgery. The pre op indications is test, catenin, whatever pre surgery lab investigation, but we didn't look into anemia. And when we looked into the peep amount of numbers of people who underwent laser before the surgery, there were almost like you know 30% of the patients didn't have any laser. No, sir. Did you find a break uh, which was not noticed at the time of surgery during the second surgery that you did? No, sir. Uh, the, the second surgery additional intervention only included a uh, gas or oil. No membrane uh, resection was done and no break was also noted. Micro breaks can be there at the edge and chronic fluid and sometimes that also dissolves. Uh, so that is your experience. And if you looked at the uh, visual acuity, these patients who had post of visual acuity recovery compared to the, both the groups, the, those that resolved early versus ones you had for a prolonged time. What's the difference, sir? I'm asking, did you find a difference? The visual acuity, the final visual acuity. Final visual acuity. Yeah, the people, the, uh, in eyes which had persistent SRF at one year, the visual acuity tended to be. Thank you, Dr. Manjul. I invite Dr. Subendu Boral. He will be presenting his paper on real world outcomes and complications in the surgical management of significant submacular hemorrhage. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody, respected judges. My uh, topic is real world outcomes in surgical management of significant submacular hemorrhage. One of us is a topic. We know the most important etiologies for submacular hemorrhage is age, neovascular, AMD, PCP, ruptured macroaneurysm, and trauma. The whole management depends on the duration as well as the size of the submacular hemorrhage. And it can be, according to survey of thermology, it can be small, medium, and the massive, depending on the size of the time uh, of the submacular hemorrhage as well as its distribution. The small macro submacular hemorrhage can be easily treated by the intravitreal injection of anti of pneumatic displacement or intravitreal TPA. For more significant submacular hemorrhage, combination of intravitreal TPA or intracolor gas, along with uh, sometimes vitrectomy with intravitreal TPA or subretinal TPA or vitrectomy with subretinal TPA plus uh, anti of submacular drainage surgery by uh, creating small retinotomy or temporal retinotomy or uh, removal of the CNVM along with the RP product, product uh, graft transplantation, multiple options are available. Our purpose was to retrospectively evaluate the real world out anatomical outcomes, functional recovery, and as well as the complications after three categories of surgical management in cases with significant submacular hemorrhage of more than four digits diameter. Uh, we retrospectively evaluated all our uh, intervent cases of 103 cases of significant submacular hemorrhage of more than 4 digits diameter in last 7 years in and we divided into 3 groups in group A less than 4 weeks uh, and confined to the macula and extending inferiorly where we did vitrectomy along with injection of subretinal TPA followed by subretinal uh, uh, anti VHF injection as well as filtered sterile air and ended up the case with uh, fluid air exchange as well as the gas tamponade, SF6 tamponade. In group 2, 4 to 8 weeks duration extending beyond macula, taking 31 cases where vitrectomy along with subretinal uh, TP injections were performed uh, given uh, for clot lysis like this. 
and then drainage of uh, divided into two groups one retinotomy group where he uh, did uh, one or two retino retinotomy to drain the lysed blood and in uh, re two group where he did temporary retinectomy like this to drain the blood as well as then followed by uh, fluid air exchange in uh, group uh, b1 and then settling the retina and doing laser in group two with the help of pfcl we settled the retina and did uh, silicon and pfcl exchange uh, finally, uh, silicon endotomerant was used in both of this group. Like in group C, uh, more than 80 weeks duration extending beyond macula, taking 10 cases where uh, what we take to meet submacular uh, removal of uh, submacular hemorrhage removal uh, with uh, by doing temporal uh, 6 to 7 clock hours retinectomy along with the removal of the CNVM, then uh, then injecting. Uh, then plan for the sub uh, RP porite path, uh, path graph transplantation by injecting PFCL to keep the retinal flap away from the working site and choose an relatively healthy area of RP chloride area uh, graft. And uh, bi manually, we uh, took the graft under the sandal slide under the PFCL. And uh, by, uh, with the help of two forceps, we uh, relocate this graft to the proposed site of the fovea, then removed graft alignment was done to, and removed PFCL and settled the retinal flap uh, injecting PFCL from the nasal side of the retina and then did laser followed by siliconal PFCL exchange. So, first of all, we uh, measured BCVA, ultra wide field fundus photography by Optos, uh, OCT, ultrasonography complications were noted and analyzed. We included all our cases with neovascular MB and PCB in origin, excluding cases with as uh, dispeller as well as the PLD night cases. So, the mean age was comparable in all three groups. This is the post operatively we uh, noticed significant visual improvements in, in all three groups. Group A, uh, the p value was visual gain was uh, p value was less than 0 0.001. You can see after three weeks of surgery, the uh, submacular hemorrhage completely re resolved and only the submacular CNVM is there and visual improvement in group two also visual improvement was uh, was quite significant in both B1 and B2 both retinotomy and retinectomy group, but uh, you can see the complete resolution of all submicron hemorrhage. We did performed independent and sample T test where we showed that all these three, two groups were compatible and there was not much of uh, difference as far as the visual uh, gain was concerned. In group C, the visual improvement was quite significant. People was less than 0 0.001 in both of these example cases, we can see the RP chloride patch graft under the fovea is gradually incorporating into the uh, with the RP chloride complex. And uh, when we notice the complication, we tabulated the complication in group A, recurrent submacular hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage, high femur, as well as the secondary macular hole formation was quite high. Quite, uh, these are the not, uh, these are the quite notable con uh, complications in group B, recurrent submacular hemorrhage, high femur, and the ear information was uh, quite high. Group C hypotony was uh, was uh, was the principal uh, complication factor, and these are just a few examples of postoperative complication in Group A. Uh, you can see the um, submacular hemorrhage completely resolved after three weeks, but again it repaired after 14 weeks. Yeah, in uh, is another uh, case where there is uh, postoperatively macular hole was formed, but that was uh, completely closed after doing resurgery with the inverted flap technique. In group uh, B, there was epidectinal membrane formation was a major complications. Another uh, important significant complication was hyphema and corneal blood staining. In group C, uh, one cases uh, of recurrent RD, you can one case of excessive subretinal hemorrhage, carrying one unique case of uh, choroidal bleed under the RP choroid uh, graft after just after putting placement of this graft and then it was resolved after uh, reapposition of the retinal frame and raising the IOP. So, logistic and algorithm of treating significant submacular hemorrhage cases are still lacking. The preferred technique often determined by the extent and the duration of hemorrhage as well as the surgeon's preference. The photoreceptors are mainly affected in submacular hemorrhage because of its destructive sharing due to the infiltration of fibrin materials as well as the toxicity of the iron, hemocytin, and the ferritin. The photoreceptor is relatively healthy till two weeks of, uh, from the onset of submacular hemorrhage. So, non drainage technique by vitrectomy with cocktail injection of anti phages, subretinal TPA, and uh, uh, filtered air, it is justifiable up to four weeks, but beyond four weeks, you can see the, uh, the, 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 uh, you have to drain the submicron hemorrhage by either retinotomy or retinectomy uh, uh, to, to, to prevent the permanent damage of the potteries as well as the RP cell activity. So, submicron hemorrhage more than uh, beyond four, eight weeks and beyond macula, there is RP severe, RP decompensation to combat that full thickness, RP correct graft transplantation is necessary. When you uh, compare our study with the other study, it was comparable slightly more incidence of uh, macro in group A. In group B, the, all the complications are quite comparable. 
and group C also the complications are compatible. So, uh, management of the submacular hematis depends on the extent as well as the duration of the hematis. Surgical intervention in significant submacular hematis more than eight weeks, more than four weeks, uh, four weeks diameter are visually rewarding, though occasional complications may arise. So, early frequent follow up is necessary after the intervention. These are my differences. Thank you. Anti VEGFs after the surgery in any of these cases? Yes. Submacular recurrent hemorrhage yes. was one of the important complications in all the three. Yes, sir. Uh, in uh, non drainage cases, post submacular as anti VEGF post operatively. In non drainage group, group A, not in group and group B. Because in the, group A, you injected also sub, sub retinal anti VEGF. Anti -VEGF. But still, there was recurrence of CNB because we have not removed the coronal neovascular membrane in that. Drainage group, we removed the Group A, non drainage, group B, drainage, group C, drainage plus RP coroid graft. Group A, we have not removed the PM, so there is some kind of recurrence I have noticed in few of my cases. So I did have recurrence in the other two groups also? Not that much. Extent of involvement is one thing. What uh, is a mechanical? Yes, sir. In drainage, but in drainage technicals also, where we are removing the uh, neovas membrane in retinectomy group, there was hardly any recurrence of CNVM or hardly any recurrence of submacular membrane. But A and B one, where we are not removing the submacular uh, subretinal membrane, but uh, subretinal uh, neovascular membrane. In those cases, recurrence chance of recurrence is there, especially in notice. Yes, if it is there is evidence of recurrence of CME, interretinal fluid, subretinal. Group A post treatment ICG, I have not done, sir. Good suggestion, sir. I have not. Good. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bo. I have a question for you. You had three groups. How yes. did you randomize? Maybe I missed it. What were the baseline characteristics between the three? Basically, uh, uh, you are uh, it's quite a good question. Basically, I have not done the randomization because it is a retrospective study. Second thing, uh, when I started this managing this kind of cases, at that time, no, uh, no algorithm was there. No, there is not much of consensus what this kind of protocol you have to follow. So this is just an effort to uh, to guide to guide the rest of our colleagues to go for the like if you have not the size it is uh, there are some stray incidents of a report you can see intravitreal uh, brodocytoma along with pneumatic displacement even we have published one case series also but but some kind of protocol you have to maintain yes. this kind of size as well as the distribution not only the size if it is within the macula you can do the non readiness technique but if it is an extending inferiorly, non nanus technique is very much beneficial. But if it is extending superiorly, there is hardly any role of non nanus technique. You have to drain the blood. No, I, I understand that. Yes. But that's mostly based on your experience as a surgeon. Yes. So what I'm saying is it's probably not fair to compare the groups because the decision to do intervention was not uniform. So when we group them and make the comparison, the basic requirement is uh, surgeon has no bias. They are all randomized. So it's a beautiful work and you can definitely have an algorithm based on your experience but probably not based on the comparison because the groups are not, uh, they are disparted groups what we call. Uh, correct ma'am. Another thing was the, we, I faced a lot of complication after the surgery. So if you just, uh, just you can foresee the complications, this kind of technique, you may face this kind, like in tennis technique, you may face the early corneal blood staining. So if you are following up the case after three weeks or one month, you will lose the patient because of the corneal blood staining that I have uh, done a fantastic job. The patient is hardly gained any kind of vision, vision because of high femur and corneal blood staining. That's the absolutely frustrating situation for a surgeon. That is Thank, it. You. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presenter is 
professor naresh babu is presenting on staged surgical approach for grt associated retinal detachment uh, thank you dr say and thank uh, all so we know the definition of giant retinal tear is usually a tear which is involving at least 90 degrees or 3 clock hours or more See, they are uh, associated with uh, Ossipetrous detachment, and because of that, we'll be having, uh, right? Uh, we'll be having the radial cuts and uh, rolling of the edges, and usually, because the what do you call the RP is exposed, we having severe PVR in these cases. And because the posterior edge of the uh, GRT lacks vitreous support, there can be a rotation of these flaps posteriorly. And when we operate, we have seen in few cases. You can see this is a post-op of a case operated having a. A macular fold involving the macula, and then we have to go in for a, another surgery by inducing the detachment again and settling it. So the aim of uh, our study is to basically compare the past plan of vitrectomy for retinal detachments associated with giant retinal tear in uh, two stages versus one stage. In the two-stage surgery, we have done the past plan of vitrectomy, filled it with uh, silicon oil and the PFCL, and then we have taken it for the second surgery. And uh, before going into the two-stage uh, how did this uh, idea evolve? Because uh, you know, P PFCL is a very heavy liquid, and it reduces the empty space in the inferior vitreous cavity for the migration of the retinal pigment epithelium. So thereby, it prevents the proliferation, and there is a, a little chance of uh, redetachment. And it also prevents the inferior compartmentalization. And moreover, when you inject PFCL, the oxygenation of retina is better with that, and it also lowers the need for scleral buckling in many of these cases, not only this, even in case of a RD with CT, where we will have to do a uh, scleral buckling. And most important thing is it allows the supine positioning of the patient. Most of the time we tell them to, go, to lie, I mean prone, but when we objectively check, none of the patients are lying prone and most of them are lying supine and uh, by injecting this, it facilitates the resetting of the uh, <coughs> retina. And PFCL is also very ideally suited for the manipulation of the retina and displacing the subretinal fluid into the vitreous cavity due to the high specific gravity. And it also helps in the flattening of the posterior fold. And most importantly, when we do a fluid air exchange to inject silicon oil, we can many a times find the slippage of the retina in giant retinal tear that is avoided by this. So in this, basically what we have done is we have had two groups. In the first group, as I have told, uh, we have done a vitrectomy, the conventional 23 or 25 gauge pass plan of vitrectomy. You can find in this video we are using a 6 mm cannula. In spite of that, we are not able to see the tip because the choroidal detachment associated with this chronic uh, detachment with the uh, GRT and CD was there. So then we used the light pipe to manipulate. And when we entered, we could find a chronic retinal detachment in this with a giant retinal tear. And we can see the rolled edges. Usually, uh, we don't uh, cut these rolled edges because we'll be having a deficit of retina. So it was uh, straightened with the help of a uh, uh, tannus, and the edges were cauterized. And you can still find that a lot of, uh, so, I mean, choroidal detachment still persisting in the periphery. So we inject PFCL, and once it is done, go for the window laser after doing a complete uh, vitreous base. And usually in this uh, first stage, as I was telling, we'll wait for inject the PFCL up to 80% and the top 1.5 to 2 ml is stopped up to 1000 uh, dentistroke stroke silicon oil. And it is left inside the eye for 5 to 7 days. Once that 5 to 7 days uh, and with a prone position done, then we go for the second stage. In the second stage, a very simple procedure. Because the PFCL settles below, we'll have to aspirate the PFCL first and then we can remove the silicon oil coating. We are doing a fluid air exchange after doing that. And additional laser is uh, given for these cases. Once it is done, then there is no slippage. No, uh, We can go in for a tamponade with silicon oil. Nowadays, we have started uh, tamponading that. So the primary outcome measures of this surgery are to look for the anatomical reattachment the end of the first post-operative, final post-operative visit. And we want to know the secondary outcome being the post-operative complication and the final issue. Patients, there were 30 patients with the 25 being male. And the average age was 41.6 years. 
and uh, there was a total detachment in case of uh, 20 eyes and in case of 10 eyes it was subtotal detachment. And the number of eyes randomized for two stage was 18 and the other one was uh, 12. And if you see actually uh, the PVR grade CR above was uh, significantly high in two stage surgery and it was uh, and the reattachment was 83 percent in case of two stage whereas it is 75 percent in case of uh, single stage surgery and the final visual outcome was uh, better in case of two stage surgery almost uh, two third uh, having a good vision of 20 by 200 or better and two line improvement was also better in case of case surgery. And these are the complications which we encountered. Cataract was found in two cases and uh, one case of uh, out of four had um, cataract in case of a single stage surgery. There was a transient IOP in most of the cases uh, in two stage and that was temporary and most of them were treated with uh, anti glaucoma medication topically and they all responded well. And uh, there was a fibrinous reaction also but it was not very severe. It was uh, not uh, having any additional um, uh, effect on the final outcome and the retained PFCL was seen in of the cases and that was pre-retinal and it was le left alone. So the management of GRT has been uh, attempted with uh, several surgical uh, procedures but however we found that uh, this uh, stage is uh, quite uh, gratifying and it is uh, very uh, useful in uh, settling the cases with uh, more than grade uh, C PVR grade uh, C2 or more actually. So the basic uh, strength of this surgery, I mean the uh, study is uh, we have had a substantial number in both arms to compare and the drawbacks include multiple surgeries in all these patients of uh, two stage which we have to explain them, sometimes they may not like it so such patients cannot go ahead and we need a larger sample to I mean say whether it's really effective or not. To finally conclude the outcome of two stage surgery in a series marginally better anatomically as well as functionally as compared to the single stage surgery especially in chronic retinal detachment. No clinical toxicity, clinically no toxicity was uh, identified because of uh, using FCL and we used the median period of 5 days for retaining the FCL inside the vitreous cavity after which it was replaced and the final conclusion will be everybody can do it, you don't need any special armamentarium or skill. So with that I would like to conclude. Dr. Naresh, can we just go back to the table with the two? PVR, was it same in both the groups? There was no, some no. confusion in my mind. No, no. So it was uh, two cases of single stage and the 12 with the above in. So two stage surgery had more PVR C2. More PVR C2. Yeah, and above. My only doubt is why did you did you have to use the silicone oil in the two stage surgery in the beginning? Yes. The reason is sir, actually you only PFCL, especially in pseudophytic eyes, all this PFCL migrate to the tonics probably, they come into the AC. And uh, at the end of second surgery, we can see a thin film of PFCL coating, which don't bother at the time of surgery, but they form a bubble in or two cases we have to go and wash the so it's better to top up and the uh, moment of PFCL inside the eye is prevented by using uh, this uh, complete film. Uh, Naresh, randomize these patients into was there any specific uh, features in GRT which uh, drove you to a surgery or it was just? No sir, actually it was not uh, actual randomization like it was already decided that this group will go because anything above. Yeah. Uh, we have gone in for uh, based on this study what is your present practice so now we go for uh, almost even for uh, a fresh gi giant retinal tear we go for a two stage at the end of seven days you the pfcl inject gas and just leave outcome is good gas after you remove yes, the yes for the second stage now we have started using gas in fact uh, we don't need also because the laser takes up in four to five days reattachment is good you can leave it also with there any case i mean there are other other situations where you put FCL after vitrectomy, leave it for two weeks, days and removal. But nowhere they have mentioned that silicone oil, you know, is necessary yeah. as an additional tamper. No, I'm just trying to educate myself. So why is it does it not complicate? Because your text says you injected or PFCL till the aura. 
and then another 2 ml of silicon oil. So Popping basically, up. does the IOP go up? How much? I, I, I have shown actually in 12 cases there was a raise in IOP which was medically managed. But as I was telling, actually the moment of the PFCL, then the patient is in erect posture, moment is okay. prevented and the migration of PFCL into All the these AC. patients were pseudophagic or phagic or some of them were phagic and pseudo. No, no, some of them are, I mean, I think uh, 10 out of 30 are phagic guys. We in, you inject the PFCL, then uh, in uh, up to the edge of the GRT? Yes, above that also. Just above the edge of the GRT yeah, and I then just, you inject the silicone oil. Just topping up. Top up, as a top up. Migration of into AC. Any any toxicity studies done? ERG. And now we are doing correctly. We are doing uh, multifocal ERG as well as uh, OCT for this. But so far we have not identified anything. Damage, mechanical. Disease. I think five, five is enough of a endotamponal. Yes, sir. Actually, because uh, the supracoroidal fluid disappears in 24 hours time. Even in RDCD, we have found that number one. Number two, the laser takes only four to five days to get that 100 to 140 percentage of the coronary radiation after we do the laser. After that, I think no point in retaining that. Trauma cases, we keep the PFCL for longer. Sometimes, yes. Just wondering whether you could have made it a real two-stage procedure in that the PFCL could have been left behind for 15 days the, in view of the absence of inflammation that you noted, and then make it a real two-step in. That you remove the PFCL and be done with this yes. oil. Yeah, even uh, that is done with uh, seven days also. Telling now we inject again. The question: You says the laser would do its job in four days. Okay. And when you remove it at seven days, why put gas? Because the job is done. Job is done, but if something goes wrong, we have to answer the patient. <laughs> Here is more important than evidence. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next presenter is Dr. Srishti. She will be presenting on clinical settings, management, and factors affecting outcomes in scleral tear repairs, concurrent retained intraocular foreign bodies. Very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, so, I will be presenting our study on scleral tear with concurrent retained intraocular foreign bodies. I have no financial disclosures. And these are the abbreviations used in the presentation. Sorry. Uh, so, um, a brief background before we go into the details of the study. Uh, intraocular foreign bodies account for uh, 16 to uh, 40 percent of all cases of uh, ocular trauma and up to 43 percent of eyes with traumatic endophthalmitis have an intraocular foreign bodies. Uh, intraocular foreign bodies most commonly have a corneal or zone 1 entry and those that do enter through the sclera uh, tend to preserve more uh, energy with uh, result in greater posterior segment damage. So the lacunae in literature is that most studies focus on the subset with corneal tear with retained foreign body, which is the more common presentation. And ours is the first and largest retrospective series to focus on the subset with a predominant scleral tear with retained intraocular foreign body. And the aim of our study is to elucidate the clinical settings and elaborate on, on the factors affecting outcomes in this unique subset. So ours was a retrospective, consecutive, non-comparative case series that was conducted across four tertiary eye care centers in our network. And the objectives are to report the clinical settings of scleral tear with retained intraocular foreign body and to elucidate the factors affecting anatomic and functional outcomes, this subset. So data was retrieved from the electronic medical records between January 2017 to 2021. Uh, detailed demographic data, clinical findings were documented, and an ultrasound B scan and CT of the orbits was done to confirm the presence of um, intraocular foreign body. Further surgical intervention was guided by the intraoperative view and the discretion of the operating surgeon. The mode of uh, trauma was defined as per the Birmingham eye trauma terminology, and the zones of involvement were also clearly documented. 
the ocular trauma score was applied to all cases uh, in our subset. So a favorable anatomic outcome at last follow-up was defined by the presence of globe integrity and attached retina, the absence of hypotony and inflammation. And a favorable functional outcome was defined by best corrected visual acuity better than 2200 uh, based on prior criteria used in similar literature. Appropriate statistical tests were applied based on the nature of the data distribution and a multivariate logistic regression analysis was done uh, to assess the factors that independently impacted the final anatomic and functional outcomes. So before I go into our results, I'd like to briefly highlight the importance of multivariate logistic regression analysis in our study. So in any study, the mere incidence of a factor such as age or gender being higher in one group when compared to the other is not enough to call it a risk factor in isolation. So when we have multiple variables impacting outcomes uh, like in our study, logistic regression analysis helps us to look at all of them together. And the final odds and coefficient of each individual factor helps us understand if this factor in fact impacts the final outcome and if so, to what degree. So coming to our results, uh, we had 139 eyes and the age of presentation was uh, median 29, majority were male, 95%. Penetrating was the most common mode of trauma seen in 87% and the most common zone of involvement in our study was zone 2 in 70% of the cases. A manifest scleral tear was observed in 77% and uh, metallic foreign body in 67% and notably an organic foreign body in nearly one-fifth of our cases. Associated findings included a traumatic cataract, retinal detachment in up to 8% and endophthalmitis in nearly 20% of the cases. So uh, there was a statistically significant difference between the vision at presentation and at final visit. The median time interval between presentation and uh, primary tear repair was 19.1 hours and a vitrectomy on the day of presentation at the time of primary tear repair was done in more than half the cases. Uh, the mean duration of uh, follow-up was about four months. A favorable anatomic outcome was achieved in more than two-thirds and a favorable functional outcome in one-third of the cases. So a multivariate analysis was done and the factors assessed included age, gender, mode and zone of injury, the presenting vision, the ocular trauma score, the associated retinal detachment, endophthalmitis and factors specific to the intraocular foreign body. So of all these factors assessed, the factors impacting final favorable anatomic outcome were better presenting vision, the absence of associated endophthalmitis, and the ability to successfully remove the intraocular foreign body. The factors that impacted favorable functional outcome were older age at presentation, better vision at presentation, the presence of a manifest scleral tear as opposed to an occult tear, and the absence of associated endophthalmitis. So briefly comparing our uh, paper with similar studies on uh, open globe injury with retained intraocular foreign body, as you can see ours was the largest series and the most common involvement was zone 2 as we discussed, most studies focus on zone 1 involvement. Uh, endophthalmitis rates were on the higher side in our study and the final visual acuity is probably lower because of the more posterior zone of involvement. The strengths of the study lie in this being the largest series so far to describe a scleral tear with retained intraocular foreign bodies with a robust regression analysis that helps us understand the factors that finally impact outcomes in such eyes. Uh, limitations are inherent to the retrospective nature of the timing as the type and timing of uh, uh, intervention were not uniform and the ocular trauma score which was uh, applied in the study was done retrospectively. So important conclusions are that with early primary repair and vitrectomy, a favorable anatomic outcome can be achieved in two-thirds of these eyes with a favorable functional outcome in up to one-third. An occult scleral tear was notably associated with poorer outcomes. A better presenting vision and the absence of endophthalmitis were finally the strongest predictors of a favorable outcome. So pertinent takeaways from our study are that it is important to sustain a high index of suspicion for possible occult scleral tears when the history and mode of trauma point towards one. It is important to intervene early when the vision is good 
and also to intervene early to avoid the risk of subsequent endophthalmitis setting in. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for your patient list. Well presented. I had one question. For all cases with intraocular foreign body, then how can you have an occult tear? Sometimes the tear is so that it or it has not been detected. But you have diagnosed intraocular foreign body means it has breached the globe and there must be a tear. There are also cases so, I mean I'm just wondering what is the definition what's your definition of an occult tear? Occult tear was something that was not uh, detected operatively, but there was a suspicion of occult tear on signs such as But MRI. IOFP was diagnosed on, on, on I mean, for... Yes, sir. If the, or there were cases where the IOFP was detected intraoperative. That were also intraoperative. Yes, sir. Patients who had occult tear with intraocular foreign yes. body, which were not really detected preoperatively when they were the taken up for... would have come on the B scan and CT that was performed. Do you really mean to say that during the primary repair, repair was missed or the primary repair was not done? That's what you're calling occult? No, no. By occult, I'm saying not detected on clinical exam preoperatively. Missed here. Yes. Your final conclusion, early vitrectomy, early surgery, but the outcomes that you measured, it don't look like you took the duration of intervention from the onset of or the time of injury it was not there listed so i just wanted to understand how did you come to that conclusion that early vitrectomy so uh, it moved after the cases in the study uh, vitrectomy was done at the time of uh, first the primary tear repair of 57 percent and even the others where it was not feasible uh, they were in a median time of weeks but also, did you take into the consideration the time of injury versus the time it was intervened? Is that taken into account? Time of injury from the time the patient injured and then when you intervened, was that taken into account for your outcome measurement? No, sir, that was not in the logistic. Also, you said primary repair with early vitrectomy, something you repair and vitrectomy. Was it one stage? Yes, uh, in 57% of the cases, it was a single stage process. And uh, you did ultrasound on an open globe injury to localize the foreign body? Not uh, in large uh, tears with, with uh, uvial prolapse, but in smaller tears, yes, a gentle ultrasound B scan was done. A gentle ultrasound, even if you were not sure of the perforation? Yes. Actually, did you ever have, uh, sorry, sorry. Did you ever have a uh, case? Of the is setting in after the repair surgery. And so, so the cases were uh, already there would be a suspicion of it intraoperatively or it's uh, set in within 48 hours, a very short time. But I'm asking you that you had end of is after the injury. No, sir. Sometimes, sometimes they can come on the first day or the day of injury. When you operate, you see that there is end of is developing after the. In some hours. cases, only tear repair was done in the first sitting and then IOFP removal uh, later. So in those cases, if uh, end of had developed, then subsequent measures were taken. In relation to the size of the foreign body? We did analyze, but it did not come out significant in the logistic regression analysis. Okay, and just one point I wanted to say. Multiple procedures would have been highlighted because most patients with ocular trauma will need multiple procedures. So of surgeries that they required and how many number of patients had to you do the surgery they may come have a recurrent detachment they will need another procedure so in ocular trauma multiple interventions data on multiple interventions i mean interesting uh, one of the other probably biomarkers for poor uh, so i mean why is it that uh, occult had bad prognosis can you tell me why Possible reasons is one, as I said, occult tears are likely, which is why yeah. they were missed in the so first case. Basically, case. they are all zone 3 injury. Occult is always a zone 3 injury, and zone 3 injury is obviously. Things one. So we are comparing this with Western literature, and as I pointed out in our study one-fifth of the cases were an organic intraocular foreign body, much higher 
compared to Western. So no, not with end off, without end off. Yes, sir. So and the compared. end off rates were higher in the group with organic foreign body. And additionally, our patients tend to present a little later or they're from the room sitting. So I think that also adds to the higher end off rate. The study is just a multiplet of, of 139. You had two groups. I mean, group one in which you had vitrectomy, little tear repair, as the first, as the first uh, surgery. Group two, where little tear repair was done, and then vitrectomy and intraocular foreign body was was done as a second stage. So, was there a factor in your outcome? Uh, yes, I didn't uh, compare that. Was that's uh, the what cases... the question we keep asking. Yes. Should I should I repair and send you, or should I send you with the open globe and intraocular foreign question? One call we get. So oh, we don't have answer to that. We say, okay, you do the skeletal tear and send me. I will remove the foreign body. No end of calamity matter. So that's so the point really the being burning that a question. primary tear repair or vitrectomy at the time of primary tear was generally done when the tear was smaller and it wouldn't be too traumatic for the eye. So very large tears, it would not really be useful. So we have to wait for the inflammation to subside with the coat and then intervene bit of two. So by nature, I think not compare the outcomes in these. No, but the logistic regression analysis did not find that to be a factor. Yes. The final outcome. Yes, sir. Dr. Srishti. So, I invite Dr. Dipendra Singh. Inverted flap for all. Anatomical and functional results of inverted island flap technique for idiopathic non myopic macular holes for all sizes. Good evening and uh, thank you VRSI for uh, accepting this app. Uh, after uh, Nav Rocky and uh, Dr. Michalaska made it popular, a lot of us have adapted this uh, inverted ILM flap technique. And we are virtually actually using it for all macular holes. And uh, that's when, uh, you know, we decided that let's see and review our own data to see how these eyes are performing. These are all my uh, co-authors and of course I don't have any financial user here. So uh, all of us know that outcomes of inverted ILM flap technique has been reported to be uh, favorable in large macular holes and myopic macular holes, myopic macular holes with detachment. But most surgeons tend to avoid uh, ILM flap for smaller macular holes for two reasons. One is uh, there is already a good anatomical success reported with uh, small macular holes. And second, uh, there is a concern that it might do some kind of harmful impact on macula if you use ILM flap for virtually all holes. Uh, and of course, we, do, we have no clue about the visual impact of uh, ILM flap on smaller macular holes. So that's what we tried to find out with this retrospective analysis to see whether this inverted ILM flap technique, if it is done for smaller or medium sized holes, which we defined as less than 250 micron for small holes and less than 400, between 250 to 400 as medium size holes. Uh, uh, this is different from earlier studies where they would say less than 400 are smaller holes and now more and more reports are considering 600 microns also as a cutoff. So we wanted to actually see the impact of flap uh, on these holes. Of course, consecutive idiopathic non-myopic macular hole cases of all sizes were enrolled. And all cases were operated by inverted ILM flap technique. We ruled out patients having coexisting macular problems, any history of trauma, and the eyes having uh, lesser follow ups, like follow ups uh, less than six weeks. The technique was very fairly uniform for all these cases 25 gauge vitrectomy with BBG dye, and ILM flap technique uh, was multi layered in some cases and unilayered uh, single flap in some other cases. Followed by a 360 and another 360 degree uh, peeling, so that total amount of peeling is more than this di uh, two disc diameter for all cases. We also use C3F8 gas for all these patients as a standard approach. Now, for this study, we uh, extracted all the data relevant data from EMR, surgical videos, uh, OCT scans, visual equity recorded at all the visits. Three of our co authors did a very detailed analysis of all the OCT scans looking into. Uh, ILM flap, whether it is present or not post operatively, the continuity of EZ, IZ lines, tunnel limiting membrane. What we were keenly interested was to analyze that what is what is the anatomical and visual impact of eyes 
showing ILM flap post operatively on OCT scans uh, and in all the three macular hole size groups. And if there is any adverse effect of this ILM flap in any of these macular holes. This is just to show that all only those eyes where surgical videos were reviewed and we found that there was a retained flap at the end of fluid air exchange were enrolled. So this is quite different from earlier studies. And uh, in general this is uh, again uh, this was five years data so all we could only enroll 40 eyes of 38 patients because of the all exclusion criteria. Mean age was 62 and you can see they were fairly small size macular holes with mean macular hole minimum diameter of 348 uh, microns but follow up was good. You can see uh, 527 days follow up uh, mean follow up for all of them. Uh, and 16 out of 14 eyes out of this have undergone simultaneous cataract surgery but it was evenly distributed in all macular hole size groups. Uh, we could uh, and you can see the distribution of uh, macular holes size wise 14 were large holes and 13 was each in small and medium size groups. The anatomical closure was 100% in all these 40, uh, 40 out of 40 eyes. Overall visual equity improved uh, from 0.87 to 0.35 logmar. And when we analyze post operative scan of all these 40 eyes, 72% eyes had ILM flap visible on post operative OCT scan. And out of all these 29 eyes, uh, we could see fine gliosis which, which was affecting visual outcome in just one eye and which we have reported also. This is just uh, to show you that this was again a very interesting observation from this retrospective analysis. All 14 out of 14 eyes large with large macular hole we could find a ILM flap post operatively but for medium it was just 8 out of 13 and for small size holes it was just 7 out of 13. Probably there was a bias uh, because surgeon probably knew it's a larger hole the attempt to put a hole a flap on a hole was too, uh, too focused as compared to the smaller and medium hole this being a retrospective study we can't control it. And if when we try to compare the change in visual equity from uh, pre-operative to final uh, visual equity, there was no statistically significant difference in visual improvement in any of the macular hole size groups based on whether they had ILM flap or no flap. So in all macular hole size groups, flap or no flap on OCT, the visual outcome was same. Visual improvement was quite comparable. And on the right side, you can see as you all know, the larger holes, they do uh, less better. So uh, the visual improvement was just 0.47 uh, and as compared to medium where they had 0.54 and 0.56 in the smaller holes. But our interest was not to compare large with uh, smaller holes. Our main interest was to look what had happened to small and medium size holes. So if you see uh, again uh, visual uh, improvement was quite comparable between flap and no flap group. The blue bar is actually the ILM flap where we had ILM flap on OCTs post ops. The yellow bar is no flaps. So it was no, no statistically significant difference. But in the medium size group, if you can see, there was a trend towards better visual outcome in the eyes having ILM flap on post operative scans. Although the number is still very small, I will not conclude that this, this should be the take home. But this is a very interesting observation uh, we found in this study. And follow up, of course, was quite long and comparable in all the groups. This is the eye which had, which developed gliosis. Uh, 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 during follow up from the ILM flap but uh, and this was a medium size hole and on your left side you see very small hole 166 micron and this lady is now coming for 6 years with all the flaps lying on macula with no adverse anatomical or you know visual uh, impact. These are all 15 eyes the small and medium group you can see the flaps in all of them and uh, most of them I, I think they are doing very well anatomically and uh, functionally. This is the one which has demonstrated gliosis and uh, leading to reduction in the visual equity. So overall I think study uh, strength of this retrospective analysis is single surgeon uniform technique. When I say uniform technique is amount of uh, exposure to dye, uh, the manipulations and the whole thing was done similarly in all the eyes because initial attempt was to have a ILM flap for all cases. So that's why it is a very uniform technique for all these cases. Of course. A good uh, follow up and serial OCT scans available and we we are sharing this uh, the impact of hole on the even smallest size macular hole. But of course it's a retrospective study there is no control group 
E3F8 gas was used probably, uh, you know, so that's why we can't comment on anatomical success because it was used smaller holes also, small sample size and we didn't. Uh, so to conclude, I think, uh, fine, I think, uh, general, I'll conclude by saying that in our this small retrospective analysis, we didn't find any significant adverse uh, anatomical or visual impact on of ILM flap on smaller macular holes. So what can be the take home from for all of us from this analysis is really it we can now look at uh, like I have already uh, this was Sir, completed two years back. Sorry. Yes, sir. Question. The ILM uh, was visible in 72 percent point of time. If first follow up, when we could obtain a appropriate OCT scan, when gas disappears with current generation OCTs, now we can actually scan through. But spectralis here to initial phases is very well visible. All these scrolls of ILM, but with not always with all OCT, but yes, whenever it was available, uh, visible, we. And interestingly, once it is visible, it stays there for very long, it doesn't disappear. For uh, now, doubt? Regular holes, uh, you know. No, I think multi layered, I, we have stopped doing. We have, as, after this, my own analysis, I stopped doing multi layered uh, flaps, especially for smaller holes. I started trimming the uh, flaps, which I was not doing. And probably now we have, we, we can look at going for lesser tamponades. As uh, F6, I have already shifted for last few years. You can think of using gas only as tamponade, which a lot of colleagues were already saying. I think one advantage of this. Oh, so do you use uh, flat? Yes, yes, now. 20 okay. millimeter vacuum and momentary cuts you can do it in a very controlled way now. Light of trimming, <coughs> you had those ILM visible. After surgery, I think in any way uh, by trimming further, it could have improved the visual acuity even more. I think this data, last two years' data, I have yet size. But one interesting thing which we observed was if they don't develop gliosis in first six weeks, they will never develop. So, first six weeks is the period. So, now uh, there are two learnings. One is we can reduce the tamponade, second, we can think of inhibiting the gliosis also. We can think of injecting. Uh, Foley tracks or something. If you start seeing gliosis developing on post-op OCT scans, if you start, you, you follow them serially on OCT, then you see gliosis coming up. You can think of inhibiting it by something. That's only in one case that all this. But and for that it, one, it case, happened in front of us, so it was very like I was just not knowing what to do. I knew vision is deteriorating, and you will not dare going in and taking off the flap. It might open up the hole. So now I'm thinking I could have tried uh, polytrax or something. I mean, I had two questions. One is, uh, at the end of this analysis, whatever you have done, or have you changed anything in the way you manage? That's one. Second is, alluding to this E3F8 versus I don't think there is any difference. Either of the gas in the final, is there a difference in it? Yes, yes. I think uh, for medium sized holes, I think the one big advantage of flap is, Sometimes tamponade is gone and you see a hole which is open but still covered by a flap. And those holes, they close. And they were not closing when we were not using flap. So failure was declared quite early uh, without flap technique. But ever since we started using flap, now we wait and many of them actually close if they have a flap in place. This is very typical about medium size holes. Rather now I am very, uh, not very big fan of using flaps on large macular holes. Because if they go for type 2 closer, it invites lot of gliosis and fibrosis in the pit which gets created. Really works you when your tamponade is gone and hole is still open. Sir, next presenter is Dr. Santosh Mahapatra. This topic is 52 week open level dose escalation study to evaluate the safety and efficacy of multi characteristic opsin in patients with advanced retinitis pigmentosa. Can I start? Good afternoon, one and all, respected. 
I'm here to present our results on 52 week open label dose escalation study to evaluate safety and efficacy of multicharacteristic opsin patients with advanced retinitis pigmentosa. I have no financial interest. Why optogenetic gene therapy? Because as you all know, the current treatment options for retinitis pigmentosa are either retinal prosthesis, medical treatments, gene therapy, or stem cell therapy. But use of electrodes is invasive and has limited resolution. Classical mutation specific gene therapy requires presence of photoreceptors and is not applicable for advanced RP. Mutation independent optogenetics allows high resolution of vision restoration by photosynthesizing the retinal neurons, bypassing the photoreceptors. Hence, this formed the basis of our study. And what is multi-characteristic opsin? Uh, Multi-characteristic opsin in uh, contrast to monocharacteristic opsin, which, is, which requires intense light for its activation and produces suboptimal neuronal stimulation, and also requires glasses to stimulate the retina. It has advantage of being activated in ambient light, generates significant photocurrent without need of glasses. And this can be delivered with a simple technique of intravitreal injection. The targeted cell being bipolar cells, which can be uh, uh, converted into photoreceptors. With basis of this and previous studies on mice and higher animals like dogs and uh, monkeys, we took off this pilot study after necessary ethical clearances. The uh, study was designed for 52 weeks and the primary enrollment criteria being either just perception of light or hand movement in the study eye and no better than counting finger in the fellow eye, regardless of the RP gene mutation. They are divided into three cohorts. The first received 1.75 in 10 to the power 11 vector genome per eye. And after studying the uh, tolerability, we went for a higher dose with 3.5 into 10 to the power 11 vector genome per eye for the next three patients. And after establishing both the tolerability as well as efficacy, the same dose was being used for the next five patients. The demography included six males, uh, six uh, uh, males and five females between the age group of second to seventh decade of life. All the uh, patients were analyzed for genetic uh, study and uh, ABCA4 was the most common uh, mutation we detected. Coming to the safety profile, uh, there was no serious adverse e events in any of the patients and there was no NCO related systemic events. At the same time, ocular events like endophthalmitis, retinitis, choroiditis were also not reported. But there was mild to moderate inflammation and increase in intraocular pressure in some of the subjects which required topical medications to control them. And there was no uh, increase in neutralizing antibodies against the NCO carried by adenovirus. And this was documented by doing a neutralizing antibody test in all of the patients. Retinal toxicity was also evaluated by doing serial OCTs and no subjects exhibited retinal detachment, cellular growth or macular edema throughout the study duration. So the gain in visual acuity, uh, as you all know, can be uh, was done by computerized fiber visual acuity, uh, which is accurate and reproducible in these low vision uh, patients. And there is substantial dose-related gain in visual acuity at 16 weeks, which are maintained throughout the study duration. Seven out of 11 
subjects gained more than 15 letters and 3 out of 11 gained more than 30 letters. So the, here is a uh, here is a, a small video of uh, is it playing. Yes, it is a small video of uh, why a mobility test and the patient is been instructed by the guider to. Yes, now you can see this is before injection. And this is 16 weeks following injection, the retained till 15 weeks. This is how the patient. This is another patient with a A mobility test. Y mobility and A mobility are the paramount importance because these low vision patients can really determine the functional vision. Post injection. So the improvements in visually guided mobility test can be documented on this table which was uh, one or two change in the scale where uh, that was from 0.5 to uh, 1 locks. We have also done uh, pre and post injection ERG, uh, MCR study and uh, visual question function hour, but this could not be included due to paucity of time. So I will summarize with the findings that there is favorable safety profile with no serious adverse effect. There are mild increase in IOP and ocular inflammation which are well controlled with topical medication and no increase in neutralizing antibody against any uh, in any patients and there is dose dependent increase in visual function and functional fusion. With the results of this pilot study, FDA approved a randomized double mask control multicenter study in USA which is being conducted at six centers now. I would like to thank my co-investigators for this wonderful study. Thank you very much. What is this material MCO that you said you are injecting inside the eye? Uh, this is a adeno associated virus carried multi characteristic opsin, which has the property of uh, getting uh, attached to the bipolar cells, bypassing the uh, photoreceptors, which is seen in, in case of advanced retinitis pigmentation. Also said that the bipolar cells get converted to Photo photoreceptors. They act like photoreceptors. Yes. They, uh, with, uh, on ambient light, they can act like photoreceptors and the current is being conducted. It has also histochemically demonstrated in uh, uh, mice and also dogs and it was published also. You said 30 letters but then all patients had hand movements or PL vision. Can you get 30 letters? So this is in fiber visual acuity, not in uh, Snell's study. In fiber visual acuity, calculation is different than for low, only for low vision, not low for the low normal vision Snell's. Assessment. Uh, was the study, study done? What this is uh, in uh, started in October 2019 and ended in uh, uh, September of 2020. So, so what are you waiting for? So molecular. No, I have I have presented this in AIOS also. What uh, only Rangachari, uh, I only to it is because it's a pilot study. It's the first human study. We are, we are uh, like uh, taking all the patients which has lowest vision because we don't know what will be the reaction and what will be the visual effect and uh, you have to repeat the injection I mean. till now we have uh, after completion of this 52 week study we have also done a two year follow off because uh, general rule for all genetic oh, studies how many, how many injections single injection single injection
uh, that we have, we have to do a long term follow up and we have completed the long term follow up uh, last year. No, we are, we are trying to, we are trying to see that uh, overall, uh, overall, overall uh, retinal thickness, whether in, in general the disease also causes decrease in thickness and if there is a inflammatory adverse effect from the drug, it can also reduce uh, the uh, retinal thickness and which has retained till the end of the study. Santosh, if I may, uh, where was the molecule developed? It is by Nanoscope Therapeutics US. It's developed in US. So yes. phase one trial was done in US. No. The first uh, human study is done here. Uh, but phase there one is, no is experimental. That because it is, they have uh, FDA approved it uh, in the uh, category of uh, there is no therapy for the uh, disease and they have up, uh, approved after our pilot study results. So is it approved by Drug Controller of India? No. This study is not. Uh, because but you have, can't inject in human if the DCAI no, doesn't have a no, genetic, even not for commercial I'm talking about the trial part trial part yes madam because because we have studied in 2019 and now uh, in uh, 20 the genetic uh, study protocols came telling that uh, you, you have to follow these criteria you have already informed DCJ but no approval is necessary at that point of time we have taken ethical clearance uh, from the any time you need this ethical approach, is DCGI's ethical yeah. committee has to approve. Yes. Yeah. Any phase one trial you cannot do on humans as of today. Even the same rule was existing earlier. Yeah, yes, even sir. in 2019, it the was rule existing. was existing. We, we informed the DCJ and they say you can take clearance from the ethical committee. Did you do any animal experiments before coming yes, into sir. humans? Yeah. Where was that done? That was done in US. Any other centers? No, they will come back for a global study. So mainly ah. it is a single center yes, report. Sir. Yes, ma'am. The next speaker is Dr. Mukesh Jain. He's presenting on ILM detachment in acute central retinal artery occlusion, clinical features, multimodal imaging, outcomes, and prognosis biomarkers. Good evening everyone. Uh, thank you VRSI for this opportunity. I am Dr. Mukesh, a consultant at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Bhubaneswar, and I will be talking about a novel OCT sign in acute CRAO that is internal limiting membrane detachment. I have no financial disclosure. Think. So what do we know? We know that central retinal artery occlusion is a devastating ophthalmic emergency and classically the OCT finding reveals hyper, inner layer hyperreflectivity, thickening and loss of stratification. But there is much more to be explored. Recently, uh, Venkatesh et al. have shown an uncommon vitroretinal abnormality that is ILM detachment in acute CRAO which was associated with poor prognosis. However, what is not known is the correlation of this structural OCT finding with FFA and OCTA that is the blood flow patterns. This is a retrospective observational study which was done at two tertiary eye care centers uh, over the study period of three years and we used the EMA database. We included patient non-traumatic CRAOs aged above 18 years and who had a OCT at baseline. For a quantitative analysis what we have done, we have on OCT the horizontal extent of ILM detachment was calculated on a line scan which was passing through fovea. We calculated the FAZ extent on OCTA on a 6 by 6 mm scan and on FFA using the Visupac system. All measurements were done independently by two observers and the mean was taken. We had a total of 60 eyes of 60 patients of which 18 eyes had ILM detachment. The mean age was 48 years with a male preponderance of 71%. The mean time at presentation was 4.7 days and BCV at presentation was Snellen's equivalent of 1 meter. Let me take you through some of the uh, multimodal imaging characteristics of such. This is the first case where we can see on the fundus photograph widespread retinal opacification with the cherry red spot. The sequential FFA shows that there is delayed arterial filling with macular non-perfusion and enlarged FAZ. 
on OCT, we can see that there is presence of, in addition to the classical signs, we can see a localized area of ILM detachment in the parafoveal region with a focal attachment at fovea. This is another case where we see a CRA with an ILM detachment, but what is interesting is the octa finding where both on the superficial and the deep slabs, we can see significant pruning of vessels with a large FZ, which is further confirmed on FFA with a uh, macular non-perfusion. This is a third case where we find that they have, uh, it is a CRO with an ILM detached with, which is fairly large and there is a pseudo operculum and an octa showing a large FZ. On follow up, what is very interesting to note is that there is significant RP modeling that is present at the central of the mac, central, mac, central macular region. On octa, we see that there is persistence of this enlarged FZ, which suggests that there is no macular reperfusion that is taking place. And in OCT, what is astonishing to see is there is significant disorganization and tissue loss. This is another case on follow up where on uh, FFA we find there is this, there's no evidence of macular reperfusion with significant atrophy that is. The, uh, we compared eyes with ILM detachment with those without ILM detachment and what was, uh, what we found was that eyes with ILM detachment had a poor vision that was equivalent to PL perception of light and they showed no improvement on follow up. We did a binary logistic regression to see what is the, uh, if ILM detachment was, uh, if there was anything that could predict the presence of ILMD, ILM detachment and we found that the poor baseline visual equity was, had a 31 times higher risk of having ILM detachment at baseline. We did a quantitative measurement to see and what we found in a subgroup analysis of four eyes of four patients that the extent of ILM detachment on OCT correlated significantly with that of an enlarged FZ on OCTA as well as on FFA. So we went to a literature review to understand that what could be the cause of this. What we understood is that the different cell lines react differently to the same degree of ischemic insult. The neuronal cells are more susceptible to ischemic insult than, than of glial cells. What it means is that with the same pain stimulus, there is different response in different individuals. So the possible hypothesis that we are that molar cells are glial cells and provide major architectural support to the retina and we found in our study that the ILM detachment cases had profound macular ischemia. Thus with increasing degree of ischemia it is possible that more and more molar cells get injured and this lead to structural disintegration leading to the presence of ILM detachment. Although this study is not without limitation, the retrospective nature of the study with loss of valuable data and because a limited number of eyes, we could do a quantitative analysis. However, the strength are that the pathogenesis of this ILM detachment in CRO has been revealed for the first time using multimodal imaging. To conclude, uh, it is a novel OCT biomarker which correlated with macular non-perfusion. We had uh, eyes with ILM detachment, had a poor baseline BCVA and it showed no improvement on follow-up and thus validating its use as a poor prognostic tool. Uh, this is our team at LVPI who helped me to uh, this project. Thank you for your kind attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Why do you think it happens? Why do you think it happens? Yeah, uh, so ma'am, as we, thank you for the question. As we see that increasing degree of ischemia, cases where there was presence of this ILM detachment, macula was significantly ischemic. So maybe That's why I'm asking. Uh, macular ischemia, how does it produce detachment from ILM? Because the glial cells are the last to get injured. Glial cells are molar cells and they are responsible for the structural integrity. They are the foot plates of, ILM is the foot plate of molar cells. So it's possible that when there is significant ischemia, disintegration of the retinal architecture leads to this complex. So it's probably the retina which is getting disintegrated and not the ILM which is getting yeah, attached. Which is the molar cells. Yeah, that's what cells. I wanted to do. What do you think are the contents of the sub-ILM layer? Sub -ILM. Uh, thank you for the question. A very interesting question. We 
Uh, however, because serial OCT scanning was not available of this, there could be some exudation component to that layer. That, that could be a possibility. Vascular, I would think of it as first. Uh, one, vascular episode. Yeah, uh, but uh, one thing that goes against us is, is there is no presence of any fluid or CME, cystoid macular edema, in any of the inner layers or neither in the outer layers. That is why we did not take it as the first possibility. Although it, there may be some presence of uh, fluid which cannot be ruled out. Not be relevant to the outcome, but how long does this ILM did last? It didn't have any CME. Like, how long did it last? We had uh, for eight weeks follow up for a patient where we found that it subsided. But, uh, we don't have long follow ups because most of the time they do not follow up. Uh, but eight weeks is what we had. There's a structural damage. Why only ILM is separated? Because it's the Miller cells, everything is getting damaged because of the ischemia, right? Why do you think only the ILM is separated? Is, it, is there any? Uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, first thing, because the inner layers are principally folded together, maybe because of the significant edema that is taking place in acutely. And Muller cells being not supported by anything because it faces the vitreous in a way. So it could be that they are the first to get uh, to have this disintegration. But and I would think that the retinal separations, the different layer separations could happen, intraretinal fluid collection could happen. That is the primary causative factor, right? Yes. Primary sir. injury because of ischemia, then you're likely to have more of intraretinal fluids being there than ILM being away. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, again, uh, uh, we had many cases in our series, which I have not presented here, where we had CME in CRAO. We actually do not know the reason for CME. And we also had a very interesting case where there was splitting of the retinal layers. And that case showed there was no blood flow in the retina, almost no blood flow. So, Yes, it could be possible if with more degree of more severity of ischemia might have this presentation too. Percentage of cases had seen CRAO? Uh, Ma'am, I have 10 cases where I have CME with CRAO. Yeah. Combined yeah, approach. I guess, uh, yeah. Basically, you get a lot of cases where you have a center. With a hyper uh, thank you for the question again. Yes, uh, we are actually looking into it, but whatever preliminary investigations that I have done, what I have seen, there is no combined occlusion as such. Maybe I'll be able to share with you after this talk to show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Last presenter for today's session is Dr. Thirumalesh, presenting on the novel small molecule mediated inhibition of ICAM mediated fix as a potential target for diabetic vascular leakage, a preclinical efficiency trial. And I thank VRSI for this opportunity. It was a very inspiring talk by uh, who said that you know, creating new research to target large diseases like diabetes and you know research should come from targets. Because uh, the story that I'm presenting is a small uh, right? So uh, the drug that I'm talking about is RW agonist. Uh, this is a very small molecule which inhibits IK mediated effects. So we uh, targeted a drug where uh, collecting aqueous in patients to what is the molecular signature of diabetic lung? When we classified them on severity, we had that the inflammatory, pro-inflammatory and pro-angiogenic there. Then we looked at uh, 
treatment outcome wise if we classify what happens majority of patients are non responders found that the soluble icam level so when we uh, dig up a little literature uh, you know that uh, hyperglycemia although is the initiating event it sets in oxidative stress and cellular grade subclinical inflammation and icam seems occurring there even before wedge started appearing and uh, then we thought that okay probably this is one of them along with tnf alpha might be breaking the red retinal barrier so to test our hypothesis further what we did was uh, we did this mechanistic i'll go back to the previous pain so these are the two barriers the endothelium and the rp so we exposed the endothelium to stress like by uh, you know taking these cells on a line and uh, you know putting them into inflammation hypoxia hyperglycemia and engineering stress and both the endothelial cells and the rp kind of expressed icam on it on protein expression when we looked at it now icam is a receptor which is found in inactive state gets activated very uh, when it is active it is up so once it is up like this over the self surface attracts the leukocytes which are there and that is because of the chemo attractants there in the factors that i showed in the picture. so when these endothelium must smuggled into the within the retina and you know that's when there is damage to the endothelial cells and rp and that's how the blood retinal barrier gets broken down now based on this what we did next was we also looked at expression what happens you know uh, if uh, that it wegf did not induce the secretion of icam so wegf has a different pathway so that we would want to verify second thing was tnf which was the early inflammation part was the one which was induced wegf for icam levels which was to be higher even in the presence of anti wegf so we thought that if i add anti wegf does this stop the answer is no if you put anti wegf particular pathway does not get affected so to confirm our hypothesis what we did was we took uh, the sd rats injected streptozoin into the, the intraperitoneal cavity of the rats and we waited for 12 weeks we ensured that the rats had diabetes by sacrificing one of them in the cage and then injected the remaining rats in two groups one we uh, our drug rwj11 antagonist and the, uh, in the other we injected anti wegf so in the sacrifice wet mounts what we were trying to see the functional readout was what is the kind of vascular leakage and how does it get affected and second thing is by doing mrna expression and looking at the secretion of pro and anti inflammatory how does that change after exposure to uh, the anti wegf which is ranibizumab which was our drug and we compared it with the novel drug that we were investigating look at picture a it's a non diabetic rat not much of a age or anything moment you see that the streptozoin induced that the multiple vascular changes look at picture c when we gave anti wegf it stopped this is what we see in clinical setups as well and the picture d is the novel drug which is acting very similar you know the anti wegf drug that we know already which is ranibizumab why we chose ranibizumab because ranibizumab is a drug which has the largest and it was the, more, uh, the earliest approved drug for treatment of dme now i would want to bring your attention to the clinical picture if you look at the top right that is a blow up of the lower part of the fa and you see that it is simulating uh, an stz rat so you know it was very similar and why we selected rats for because the control the conditions were controlled now let's go to the uh, results on the molecular expression part you can see that mrna expression uh, uh, of all the genes post test treatment so you have diabetes just like diabetes the diabetic rats also has increased icam increased wegf increased mcp1 which is very critical in bringing in leukocytes within the retina and initiating the damage and pdef is one thing which is protective to the neurons you know but what we found was anti wegf actually suppresses pdef as well along with all the factors which are unnecessary so this might be one of the explanations why you would develop what is called as atrophic maculopathy if you keep treating but icam uh you know kind of suppress the icam it suppressed mcp1 but pdf but it did not affect the other things so in a way if you look at the protective one it was not suppressing to a major level so based on this we can conclude that uh, rwj lfa1 is one particular drug you know which explores an alternative pathway potentially a drug which can be investigated uh, we do have uh, animal data at the current one we are trying to uh, build up a newer module we can where we can generate more robust data or we take it up for uh, you know human trial set later day thank you i will be open to taking any
network simulation. Are there any numbers involved in this? How many rads? Edge has five. What we did was uh, one one cage where checked stuff. Second one, all the rats are for the second and by induction of diabetes, we waited for the and then in one cage we injected the novel drug. All the all of them showed similar. All of them. Because these are controlled conditions. A diabetic patient at various stage, if you take them because they are being treated, their control is different, might be taking treatment on a different way. One subject is very difficult to achieve all the readouts. But in a mouse, you know, everything is controlled. They have diabetes right at the stage that we have detected. No treatment that they are received potential. So obviously a very uniform condition at which would he had hardly any height. That, uh, that was the A where there was no diabetes, no diabetes. at all. Yes. A and D looked more similar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, right, but uh, second thing that we need to also look into. Uh, is that uh, you know uh, we don't believe that the neovascular process probably had set in by 12 weeks. So uh, might be just the leakage which was leakage there point. and anti of kind of suppresses the second pathway as well. So this and other thing we should also look into was the dose escalation. Slightly higher. One thing is, that we should look at that we are verifying. So. Is this all lending? Well, uh, means being implicated. Dependent thing. Yes, sir. The two independent uh, this thing actually we are investigating four different uh, associated uh, uh, pro angiogenic factors uh, this was on the inflammatory side thought that uh, had a very similar kind of uh, suppression can be achieved can uh, probably change another group like you we are definitely exploring that also sir we are building up isolated icam overdrive models where we will probably you know Give them blockage, and uh, what you said is is what we are also looking at. But uh, permissions that we get from the board takes about six months. So the, for achieving this, uh, we had to wait for almost two years. So the permission takes about six to eight months to come, and after that we have to go to the animal house and then ask them to provide us the necessary animals, and then again you give the injection and then you wait, and you give the injection and then you wait for the harvesting. Um, Who's diabetes in these? These rats. What was the duration between uh, the time of induction and the development of diabetes? Twelve weeks, sir. Yes, sir. That is it. And so we uh, confirm it by sacrificing one animal, and then look at the wet mount. So once we have confirmed that it is there, then we inject in the rest of the. Of the slides that you showed of uh, the ABCD. Uh, yes, sir. Non-diabetic, diabetic. So the A was uh, non-diabetic rat. The B was the streptozoosin induced rat which had diabetes that was developed. The C was where we had given ranibizumab and the last one was where we gave the novel model. How did you document the leakage? So the cages are marked by tail marking. So the cage that has been separately it is marked and labeled and uh, it is not labeled by, uh, I mean once we label what, what, and we give it the animal house. modality of imaging I must. Uh, the leakage is, what we do after, uh, yeah thank you for the question sir. Actually, this is not a fluorescein angiogram because when you give SD rats diabetes, they develop white cataract. There is no way that you can image inside. Although the smaller mice you can, but SD rats you can't. So what you have to do is once the period is over, you sacrifice them and before we sacrifice, we give uh, fixed dextrin. So we give a tail vein injection, wait for two hours, then we sacrifice the rat and then you examine the wet mount. Once the wet mount is examined and photographed, then the retina is crushed and look for the secretory factor. Amazing work. Where do you see its role in future to the current treatment that we are giving? Thank you for the question, ma'am. I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the pathway in which diabetes kind of uh, progresses, this has a very early role. They probably in patients who have diabetes with macular edema where you see in moderate phases, probably that's where I would, that this might uh, replace giving anti of uh, Would it replace or would be additive to? Definitely added to them. I don't think anti are can be replaced. Definitely really a drug which can really add value to the treatment that we are currently giving. And this will also help in patients where there are non responses Like for example, we are giving anti injections in days that you have to give up to five injections because it's not working or you switch early. 
but whether you're switching between any antivage if you're still targeting the same pathway. Additions like this will help in uh, probably treating the patients better and probably reducing the burden of treatment. Also. Uh, your institute has been talking about measuring the different cytokines and VEGF from the tear and titrating the therapy. But do you think uh, you can measure the ICAM or some of these, uh, like peers could give you an idea as to what are the molecules, right? Uh, um, we do have the data, but a uh, lot of validation is required. Say, for example, we have collected the data, uh, although there are two schools of thought within the as well. Uh, our chairman believes that, you know, uh, dry eye can be, you know, uh, seen, monitored and given treatment. But we all know that in retinal disease, it's not possible because the treatment that the patient might be receiving is totally different. The way that diabetic control is different. So there are many factors which are there. So uh, we believe that, you know, by looking at this, you can develop newer targets, understand the disease a little better. Uh, but to reaching to a level where we will be looking at tear biomarkers and uh, uh, doing a, a tailored therapy, we are not there yet. It might take another five to ten years before. Yeah, but we you have taken the first step. Congratulations. Yes, Thank you. As we continue the session. Thank you, judges, chairpersons, speakers, and especially the audience.